Tonight, our topic is creating livable cities, a 21st century perspective. This series is a new series from the University of Manitoba that brings some of the uh, leading minds at the University of Manitoba for a dialogue with the broader community. So it depends on you coming, and we appreciate you being here. At the University of Manitoba, we are visionaries and trailblazers and innovators and pioneers and mavericks and defenders and explorers. And my colleagues who will talk to you will show their creativity and their remarks, and I'm sure in their answers to your questions. This theme is uh, something that concerns all of us. What effects do globalization, shifting demographics, resource scarcity, social changes, what, do, what effects do these have on today's urban centers? We have a number of themes within our academic enhancement pillar and our strategic planning framework, and our colleagues tonight uh, are, represent the culture and creativity theme in that framework. I'll ask each of my colleagues to speak for five to ten minutes to comment on tonight's discussion theme. They'll be using some visual images, you'll see them up here, uh, that will be on the screen to illustrate for us some of the cities and the models they'll talk about. And when they've finished, then I'll invite uh, comments, observations, questions uh, from those of you uh, in the audience. Some others will have wireless microphones. They'll be circulating. I just ask you to stand, and, and uh, one of my colleagues will come and find you with a, a microphone. And I'll just moderate the discussion as we move ahead. We had announced this for, advertised it for uh, a termination of 8.30. So just before 8.30, I'll cut off questions and uh, uh, ask Janice Ristock to summarize the key themes as she's heard them. So let me introduce our first speaker. The first speaker tonight is Ralph Stern, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. His research addresses modern theories of architectural, landscape, and urban representation. In the service of understanding architecture within a matrix of social, social cultural, and environmental concerns, his research interests Inter his research intersects areas of science and technology, history and aesthetics, memory and identity, as well as geographic exploration and environmental exploitation. He received his professional and academic education in the United States and Germany. He's a member of the American Institute of Architects and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Ralph. Thank you. Am I on? Am I mic'd? Great. Wonderful. Uh, thank you ever so much for coming tonight. Uh, but the first time I got this invitation to speak about livable cities, I said, I'll talk about unlivable cities and I'll speak about the perils of suburbanization. And then I got a follow-up email saying, you've got seven to 10 minutes. So I thought, yikes, live fast, die young. So I'm going to talk about why I find Winnipeg interesting and why my move from Berlin to Winnipeg might have some meaning for Winnipeg's development as a livable city. Uh, I've been here for a year. I don't know Winnipeg all that well, but this is my neighborhood. I live in the exchange. I like the exchange. I like graffiti, I have to say, unless the Faculty of Engineering tags are a tunnel, in which case I don't like it. Um, but I really like the exchange. I like the view out of my windows. I think it's absolutely fabulous. I like high rises. I like an urban environment for many reasons, which I think will develop over the course of the evening. I have another view that's very familiar to me. And this is a view, uh, this is an image taken a few weeks ago, beginning of September, much like uh, the view that I had 10 years ago from the same location on September, on the 11th of September. And I happened to be in New York at that time. I was teaching in New York. I was looking at this view, and I got a phone call from a colleague of mine saying, turn on the television, something is happening downtown. And what was happening in the other direction, looking south, was this. This started a whole series of conversations in New York and, of course, globally, what it means when our cities are subject to destruction, destruction of any kind. This was an act of terror. but. We also have environmental destruction. We also have man-made destruction in the guise of urban renovation, urban renewal. And this was a very interesting, for me, a very interesting point of entry into a memory and identity discourse 
that I linked back to my experiences in Berlin, because at this point in time, I'd lived in Berlin for almost a decade, and Berlin has its own very complex history. Uh, a couple of images here just about uh, German cities and erasure of memory and identity in German cities. These are two images, actually, of the firebombing of Dresden. The image on the left of each pair being the flares that are being dropped, and the image on the right, the city going up in flames. So destruction of all kinds, erasure of memory and identity of all kinds, or in Hamburg. So this is a very difficult image, but of course the 20th century has been marked by both the rise of urban environments and the destruction of urban environments, and the human toll that it can take quite literally sometimes. This fabulous image is uh, an image of uh, tracers for um, uh, aerial defense in Berlin against Allied bombers, a view that many pilots had of Berlin in the Second World War. The images on the ground look like this, just a destruction within the city. So in terms of a livable, unlivable environment, I can't think of anything that looks more unlivable than this. Again, this sort of erasure of an urban environment, a booming metropolis, into something that really looks like an image out of Hades. And of course, then, the slow rebirth afterwards, images of, let's say, urban agriculture taking place in bombed out buildings, or these almost archaic images of rubble women sweeping and pulling together rubble within uh, some of the major buildings, in this case, the entry hall to the Reichstag in Berlin. In 1945, Berlin had capitulated, an urban capitulation. What, what does this mean, an urban capitulation? We have here, then, the images of Berlin, issues of representation, Germany, year zero, by Roberto Rossellini, what it means to come out of something that is truly an unlivable environment. We have, then, a city that is occupied, subject to occupation, subject to fraternization. This was a major topic in post-war Berlin. Subject to re-education, the town patrol in Germantown. I really like this one, with all these very serious faces in the background. It was a city of uh, relaxation, life amongst the ruins. Uh, it was a city of sexualization and medicalization, warnings for GIs, warnings for the occupying forces in the city. It was a city, again, of confrontation, Cold War confrontation, between Russia and the United States, this very famous image from Checkpoint Charlie. It was a city of spies. It became, as one reads here in Funeral in Berlin, ferociously cool. So it became a cool city in its, let's say, coming back up out of this period of destruction. It became then, and this is important, a city in many ways, as it says here on the left, Stadtfront, city front, urban front, a city of occupation, a city of squats. And this is where we begin to perhaps intersect some of the history of Winnipeg, some of the history of the Exchange District, where a lot of structures that have been left partially abandoned, underused, have been occupied by very, very innovative groups. Here again, two more images from Berlin, partially ruined buildings occupied by artists, giving part of the real vibrancy to Berlin, that then leads to major artistic endeavors, such as the wrapping of the Reichstag, which itself was sort of a rebirth of the Reichstag from being a ruin into being then the capital of a new reunited Berlin. And a diagram here of what, on the left, this uh, urban planning diagram of what it mean, meant to connect East and West Berlin across a bend in the Spree. And I think about this image in terms of the planning of our bend of the Red River and the need for a larger, comprehensive, long-term vision of what that might mean in terms of its embeddedness into the city of Winnipeg. There are also ongoing, let's say, sites of resistance, sites of controversy along the riverfront. How does one occupy the riverfront? How close can one build to the riverfront? Does one have a public right of way along the riverfront? Or are developers allowed to encroach on the riverfront? And there are also real acts of festivalization in Berlin. This is an image of the Love Parade, which I think is great, which brought 500,000 to a million people to Berlin every summer for a major techno event. And of course, we have the new architecture of Berlin. So on the left here, we have an image of the 
Jewish Museum by Daniel Liebeskin, and on the right, um, a building on Pariser Platz by Frank Gehry. And here again, we intersect Winnipeg. I think of, in terms of the Holocaust Museum, the Human Rights Museum, and as we know, Frank Gehry is coming and participating in the Warming Huts competition now, or the Warming Huts event this coming winter. So when I look at something like this, I think, wow, what are the parallels? Not only, let's say, the downtown areas, but also, let's say, the move to a global presence, a global marking of Winnipeg in terms of its, its rising importance, as it were. And I think of Winnipeg's waterfront, which is at the moment a wonderful sort of environmental uh, sanctuary, but one that could be developed in wonderful ways, but needs to be developed with great care. And I think again of the Berlin waterfront situation, where there are accommodations always for provisional uses, for temporary uses, such as the image on the left here of what's called the Caparina Bar. So there is a Caparina Bar right next to the major governmental buildings of the city. And I think of something like this. I said I like graffiti. This is an image of the inner part of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall, of course, which is a mark of division, a mark of essentially terror in many ways in and of itself. Here, the Berlin Wall has been left to stand. It stands in something called the Mauer Park, the Wall Park, and it's been open to graffiti artists. So what had once been a symbol of oppression and division is now used as a site for artistic endeavor. And so again, I come back to Winnipeg, and I think in terms of the development of Winnipeg, that developers, just to use a kind of dumb metaphor here, shouldn't use tunnel vision, but should really allow Winnipeg to create, to keep and continue to create those spaces for, let's say, provisional occupancy for a lot of, let's say, it's very unique artistic characteristic. And in that, I come back full circle to this image and close on that mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Our second speaker is Richard Milgram, who is professor and head of the Department of City Planning in the Faculty of Architecture. He advocates for more socially and environmentally just cities with the Planners Network and the International Network for Urban Research and Action. His work is focused primarily on participatory design processes, urban diversity, and issues of sustainability. His current research interests include the social impacts of urban development patterns, particularly sprawl, and the production of age-friendly cities and towns, the latter with a community university research alliance based at the Center on Aging. Richard? Thank you. <clears throat> Glad to see so many people here. Thank you for coming out. I also have about 23 pages of notes, which I'll forget to read anyway, so I don't really know why I make them. Um, I just came back from a conference in Salt Lake City, uh, an academic planning conference, and was lucky enough to run into a session on livable cities, uh, which started with this list, which is the recently published uh, economist list of uh, the 10, well, there's, there's actually hundreds of cities on this list, but the most livable cities list, this being the top 10. Um, and we had a very interesting discussion around these, and a lot of it had to do with struggling with trying to figure out what exactly we meant by a livable city. Um, so, you know, this list is based on a fairly extensive survey developed by the Economist Intelligence Unit's Global Livability Service. They spell livability differently, but, you know, other than that, it's, the, it, yeah. Good, my, my, uh, my computer didn't like the spelling problems. Um, but this, you know, this is a list that includes uh, things about quality of housing, quality of open spaces, uh, access to good schools, arts and culture, all of those sorts of things. And then we, we sort of examined this list and thought about what are these cities? And first of all, they're all in the global north. Secondly, none of them were American, which we thought was kind of amusing. And thirdly, most of them are really, really expensive places to live. So all of these great assets that these cities have are not actually accessible to a lot of people just because they can't afford them. So we ended up with a very basic question when we were talking about livability for, livable for whom? That was a short page on my, on my list. 
Um, we went on then to talk about the relationship between the term livability and the way a number of different people had defined it and other terms like sustainability. And the interesting thing about sustainability is that, uh, about livability and the way it's measured is that it tends to be a snapshot in time. How good is this place? How does this place support particular types of lives at this moment? This is different from the idea of sustainability, which is something that stretches over time. So, you know, generally we're worried about how future generations are going to live, but because of my interest in age-friendly cities, I would say we should also be worrying about how we're going to continue to live in the places that we're already inhabiting as we age and our needs change. So there wasn't necessarily a good time component in this, and we need to think about livability over time. We also talked about the relationship between livability and quality of life and ended up with the idea that quality of life, well, livability, particularly because it's about the places and the amenities that support lives, um, it was only one of the components if we were going to analyze quality of life, and quality of life included other social measures and social relationships. But I think what we all agreed on is that livability is, is something that is needed to support good everyday life, so that this ends up being very much about everyday life. When I was at the University of Minnesota in the Metropolitan Design Center a few years ago, we used this list uh, when we talked to neighborhoods and parts of the city about livability. And I think that the, the list stands up pretty well as a series of considerations that, that we need to be using when, when discussing this. And it's mostly about choices and it's about opportunities. And uh, implicit in this is an idea that there is room for difference um, and um, and that, that we're not trying to be exclusionary when we're doing these things. We're not just trying to create some neighborhoods as livable for those who can afford it. Then I have my favorite Winnipeg photograph. And, you know, this is where I get a little bit historical and maybe not so upbeat. <laughs> Michelle's going to pick it up at the end and make it a little bit more upbeat. So, um, you know, this is a typical recent Winnipeg suburban neighborhood. And I would challenge you to go through that 10-point list from the previous page and see how well this stacks up against that. I can tell you it doesn't do particularly well. Um, I think it's really depressing that we don't call these neighborhoods anymore. We call them subdivisions. I think that tells us a lot about the places that we live. Um, and unfortunately, these monocultural or these monofunctional um, environments dominate on the edge of the city. And even if we're going to make places better, new places better, we're still going to have to learn how to deal with these. Um, of course, you know, again, I just point out that if you were an older adult living in here in the middle of the winter, not only are there no sidewalks, but the roads have snow on them as well. So, I mean, historically in Winnipeg, we have some charts. Um, Winnipeg has been, for many years, a slow-growth city. This may be changing, but there's always been a desire to be a booming city and an optimism that we could be a booming city. And I think the, the result of that is that we have designed a city that's bigger than we need as a, as a footprint. So sprawl is an issue. And this chart shows on the left, this does have a pointer on it somewhere. Oh, yes, yes. So 1961, um, this is the population as it rises up until 2006. The red line at the top shows how the urbanized area increased at the same time. So the population in that 40 years increased by about a third. We more than doubled the footprint of the size of the city. So we became far less dense, which is what the bottom line shows. Um, this, is, this is something that's not unusual. I mean, cities all over North America have sprawled. What's unique, and I actually think it is unique about Winnipeg, is that most of that sprawl happened in a period when, uh, before there was a lot of exurban sprawl, so it happened entirely within one municipality. So it's something we did to ourselves. It's not something we did because there were municipalities competing for different types of, uh, for, for development. In that, I thought, well, you know, we are always sort of wildly optimistic about how we're going to grow. So I went back and looked at all of the plans that have been done over the last 40 years and the growth projections that accompanied those. And so the gray line again shows the population, but all of, oops, all of these are the optimistic growth projections of the time. So we did pretty well in there, <laughs> but some of these were sort of wildly enthusiastic. Now, I'm not against a plan that accommodates growth or a plan that's 
that's designed to accommodate growth if it happens. The problem is if we build a city that requires that growth in order to be successful. And I think a plan can do both of those things, it's just the way the city has developed um, in the last 40 years hasn't necessarily, well, just hasn't done that, never mind necessarily. So we've ended up with a city that's fairly split. We have a city that on the outside now in the newer suburbs has a lot of um, relative affluence, and in the center of the city, not so much. And we've had an emptying out of the center of the city, we've had, um, and, and the amenities, the retail, the services have followed the affluence out towards the suburbs. And we're left with a, city, a downtown uh, with a predominant land use, in case you don't know, is parking. And there isn't enough of it, apparently. This is, this is what I always hear. So I've just been doing a little bit of, you know, in, in, this is part of my age-friendly research, but we've been looking at how, as time goes by, um, fewer things are within walking distance, and being within walking distance is particularly important for older adults, um, if you, especially if you lose your license as you get older. So this is Winnipeg in, um, that's all the roads in the urbanized area. That's all the pharmacies in the city in 2006. That's about 800 meters walking distance from those pharmacies. That's putting the roads back so you can see there's quite a lot of the city that doesn't have a pharmacy within walking distance. And we ended up with 400 meters is commonly used by planners as a standard walking distance. And you end up with a, with a result that says only about 14% of seniors live within walking distance of a pharmacy. And I, I did get chastised by one senior colleague who said I shouldn't assume that seniors are always sick and that they need pharmacies. Uh, but I did point out we're also going to do this for bus routes and for supermarkets and all sorts of other things. This was just a particularly easy thing to do it for. But if we look at the old pattern of the city, Spence neighborhood, um, and this is just at 400 meters, a good chunk of the residents in that area are within walking distance of a pharmacy. This is McGilvery and Keniston, for those who, of you who don't recognize it. There are no houses within that walking distance from those pharmacies. So, uh, and you end up with about 3% of White Ridge's seniors, and that's not particularly surprising. See, I knew I wouldn't follow my notes. I've just lost where I am. Um, so we're ending up with a downtown landscape that sometimes looks like this not particularly appealing. There, are, there is some hope, uh, as Ralph's already mentioned, the exchange, but there aren't actually that many people living there, except for Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few others, he's got some neighbors, but, but you know, we need a lot more people living downtown to make it work and to make it into a 24-hour downtown. There is, there is development happening on the waterfront, but, uh, and there is some attention to the public realm here on the waterfront, uh, but again, this is a little bit exclusive and I think may become more exclusive as other uses are developed down here. Uh, and I, just on a, on a hopeful note, we do have good models of complete neighborhoods in Winnipeg. And I mean, I could go through that list of 10 things and apply it to Osborne Village and just about all of them would do reasonably well. And we could tweak all of those, they could all be slightly better. But you, know, you have a variety of housing from single family detached houses to high rises. You have every age spectrum. You have just about everything you need in everyday life within a five minute walk of Osborne and River. So you know, we do have models in the city we could be following. Um, I hope we're going to do that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle and she can tell us how we might. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Our third panelist is Michelle Richard, who's the director of the newly created campus planning office at the University of Manitoba. Michelle has been a practicing urban planner for the last 17 years and comes to the university from the city of Winnipeg, where she was the coordinator of Our Winnipeg and the winner of the 2011 Canadian Institute of Planners National Award of Excellence in City Planning. Michelle holds two degrees from the University of Manitoba, a Bachelor of Arts in Political Studies, and a Master's in City Planning. Michelle? So I, I had the option of uh, deciding in what order I would speak, and uh, I'm kind of maybe regretting that I didn't go first now. <laughs> um, but here, here we go. Uh, 
I think my presentation is going to uh, be a, perhaps a bit more optimistic than, than Richard's, but uh, Richard and I have uh, certainly, I think, a, a, a history that would sort of suggest that we, we come to the same conclusions on, on issues uh, related to urban planning, but oftentimes we, we start quite, quite far apart. So I'm going to focus on Winnipeg. And specifically, what I'm uh, going to do is focus on the evolution of uh, what Winnipeggers uh, perceive to be important to them by way of livability. The concept of what exactly constitutes a livable city has been a difficult one for Winnipeg. <laughs> uh, as Winnipeggers, we have gone through and continue to go through this great process of hand-wringing about what it is that we should be valuing by way of livability. Because we have been a, gl sl a sl slow growth city, sorry, uh, as uh, was alluded to, uh, this has largely up until this point been a philosophical debate rather than a real one. Over the years, we have heard the debate. Suburban development versus downtown development. City neighborhoods versus suburban neighborhoods. Rural living versus city living. Single family housing versus multifamily housing. But, and I don't know if you agree with me, <laughs> but up until now, this debate has been just that. We've had the luxury to mull over what it is that we want from our city and our neighborhoods. But to be honest, there really hasn't been a compelling reason to really evaluate what it is that we collectively value from a livability perspective. A large number of Winnipeggers, not all for sure, uh, but a large number have been in the position to test out what it is that we think we want when it comes to quality of life or livability within our city. We have really, and I, and I believe this, have been able to accommodate our own needs based on where we are at in our lives. So I'm going to uh, open my uh, presentation with a question. Where do you live and why? I'm going to hazard a guess that many of you actually live in single family homes. And I would also hazard a guess that you do so because you are afforded a quality of life within your neighborhood that you, you would just not trade. Winnipeggers like to beat themselves up. We consistently point out that we are a sprawling city, and certainly we, we heard it. And in, in fact, uh, it, it's probably uh, worthy of debate to a certain degree. But uh, the fact is that we really haven't had to deal with the stark ugliness of sprawl. The reality is that Winnipeg's experience with suburban growth isn't even close to most major urban centers. The idea that great cities are entirely made up of great spaces, great urbanism, and density is simply a myth. We haven't really experienced the downside of the type of growth uh, characterized by tracks and tracks of monotone development, all catering to one demographic and really all auto-oriented. I just came back from Montreal and I can tell you the sprawl is alive and well there. While there's tons of great urbanism there, there's equally enough bad urbanism to balance it out. Other major Canadian metro areas are all characteristic of this type of development, Toronto, Vancouver, and Calgary, which is interesting because I think they were all on the livability list. <laughs> no, Vancouver. Vancouver, yeah. No, no but Calgary, right? We haven't, in our city, uh, had to deal with one hour to two hour commutes. This is actually a photo um, from uh, Toronto. Uh, and, and certainly even, uh, even looking at longer commutes uh, for when we're opting to use public transit. I have friends, as I'm sure many of you do, who live in Toronto and Vancouver, and I think that uh, because we're here in this room, many of our friends would uh, collectively agree that we all really value great urban spaces in downtowns. Yet. Um, if I were to talk to my friends in Vancouver and Toronto, uh, they rarely go there, except perhaps to, to go to work in the morning. Rather, most of them live outside the city where housing is cheaper. And when they do go to the downtown, they're hopping in their car for an hour, they're catching the GO train for 60 to 90 minutes. Winnipeg has largely escaped. We haven't been forced to move hours away from our employment because of affordability. We haven't been forced to commute hours a day. We continue to have fabulous cultural and recreation opportunities within proxi proximity, even without the jets. A majority of Winnipeggers have been able to purchase homes, and many have defined it by buying single-family homes. It is here that I want to qualify these statements. Winnipeggers who have resources uh, and I guess it would be qualified as being middle class, have been lucky, very lucky. 
But the reality of Winnipeg moving forward is something quite different. This slide is a bit uh, at odds with the pictures before it, but it deserves to uh, be here and to stand alone. For the first time in our history, we are facing a different reality. At the risk of oversimplifying, here are a few facts that are starting to draw a different picture moving forward. And uh, it's here that I think I'll probably <laughs> be at odds with Richard a, a bit more. Uh, Winnipeg is a growing city. Uh, it is a, a position to grow, uh, based on forecasts, 180,000 people over the next uh, 16 years. Interesting fact is that when that uh, forecast was done, which was about five years ago, there was a lot of uh, questions about its relevance and whether or not it was actually going to hold up to the test of time. Well, guess what? We're actually overperforming on that forecast. So what does that actually translate into in terms of um, housing requirements? To actually house 180,000 people will require in the area of about 83,000 dwelling units. And so to put that in context, I suspect that's roughly the size of Regina, I would think. It's around there somewhere. So the interesting quandary that we find ourselves in here in Winnipeg is that we actually don't have enough land um, based on our current development patterns, which uh, continue to be, as, as was suggested, suburban and single family to accommodate those numbers. We will run out of land in our city boundaries in about 10 years at that type of rate of growth. For the first time in our history, congestion and commuting times are challenging our quality of life. Housing affordability is now touching most everyone. It is now a luxury to acquire a brand new single family home, or definitely not as a first time buyer or a single buyer. The whole concept of home ownership is being redefined. It is, it is uh, far more uh, unlikely at this point that the vast majority of those entering into their adulthood would be in a position to just go out and, and buy a home. We are now starting to see a trend that spaces that we value as great, urban, vibrant, inclusive, walkable, and are serviced well by transit and are accessible, like Osborne Village or Wolseley, are becoming too expensive and are forcing people to look uh, outside these areas for affordable housing. Access to housing is increasingly becoming a challenge, especially rental housing. For the first time in a very long time, we finally are being challenged with the real cost of fossil fuels. We're not only being hit financially, but now have a better collective understanding of the full cost uh, associated with fossil fuels on our environment. Certainly, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm drawing attention to anything that isn't well understood. We have crumbling infrastructure. And I think this is probably the most important point I want to make, is we can no longer pretend that because we live far away from the downtown or the inner city, that the effects of poverty that touches so many of us can now be ignored. Uh, so what does this mean? For the first time in our history, our concept of livability is being challenged. We are being forced to redefine what it means uh, to, to us as Winnipegers. And uh, I, I certainly believe that this is, a, it, this is time for this conversation, and I certainly believe it's a good thing. There seems to be some residents that uh, there are some core elements of livability that we can all agree upon. The recent R Winnipeg process, which touched uh, directly with over 44,000 Winnipegers, concluded with some key agreements. Winnipegers want options. We always have, and I, I suspect we always will. From traditional single-family housing uh, neighborhoods to more dense forms of housing and development designed around rapid transit systems. This means more opportunity for mixed-use areas. Winnipeggers want to ensure mobility of all ages and abilities. We want more options for getting around. Public transit, active transportation routes that support walking, cycling, and other human-powered po forms of transportation. I'm not sure if, if any of you recognize uh, what that actually is at the bottom, the picture at the bottom. This is the new rapid transit station that actually uh, goes across Osborne. Uh, just, uh, I guess it would be south on Osborne. Winnipeggers want more areas that provide a range of options for living, working, and playing. The daily necessities of life should be within reach with options for accessing a variety of services, amenities, and resources. These communities should provide a range of housing options to accommodate various incomes, household types, and stages of life. And finally, we want a competitive city, collectively understanding that our ultimate success will depend on our ability to offer a quality of life, 
offer high quality education, a healthy environment, and recreation and cultural opportunities in order to attract and retain a dynamic workforce. So here's the good news. <laughs> Uh, Winnipeg has the capacity to respond to growth and change. This is where we are so fundamentally different than other cities. Uh, we are so well positioned to emerge as a recognized leader in creating and sustaining a livable city. We get so much of it right. We, regardless of perception, have great urban places that demonstrate walkability, density, mixed use, vibrancy. Again, such as Osborne Village, Corridon, or even new or revitalizing areas such as Kildonan Green, downtown Transcona, Old St. Vital, and West Broadway. We have a downtown that is now characterized by growth and the challenges associated with growth rather than stagnation. I completely agree with uh, the perspective that we have way too many surface parking lots, but the best part about this story moving forward is I think we're actually turning a page and seeing uh, that a, a large percentage of those parking lots are now under development pressure. Our cultural opportunities are simply the best. There's no arguing that. We have finally collectively recognized that mode shift is important. The initial contributions with rapid transit and active transportation certainly demonstrate this. We have identified areas within our city that are ready to be repurposed for mixed use development. The city of Winnipeg has in fact identified 11 of these sites, the majority of which hug rapid transit corridors. And yes, the former Southwood Golf Course is one of these. So based on a high level view, we are positioned extremely well to attract and maintain a savvy labor force. We know that this labor force is mobile and will largely decide to stay or move based on a quality of life, which is defined by the basics, quality of open spaces, well-planned areas, focus on walkability, mixing of uses, great buildings, cultural and educational institutions. However, Achieving the type of livable city that it is that we all seem to want will not be easy. The devil is always in the detail. Recreating the elements of, say, an Osborne village, being an area that offers choices in housing, walkability, amenities, and a service well by transit, or simply developing infill or redeveloping areas in our city that no longer function for their original purpose is likely one of the most difficult things to do. It is difficult to plan these areas but more so it is extremely difficult to bring people along. Uh, neighborhoods are often not okay with infill development and area redevelopment, and NIMBY often is very alive and well in our city. It is also risky. Ask any developer, and there's several here. <laughs> there is a reason why they haven't jumped all over embracing new approaches to growth and development. So, the question is, what do we do? Our challenge moving forward as a city will be to demonstrate that we are mature enough and collectively mobilized to capitalize on opportunities ahead of us. It will require collaboration and partnership across the board, institutions, businesses, developers, city and province. But without question, it will require leadership, guts, and collective ownership if we are going to keep moving forward towards the livable city that it is that we all seem to want. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> uh, I think I'll just take uh, a minute or two and ask, uh, you each came with some uh, prepared ideas and I wonder if, uh, having heard each other, whether you want to respond to anything that the others have said. Ralph? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about, I mean, there is the discourse of livable cities, right? What constitutes a livable city? And I think both Richard and Michelle have really talked about that in terms of short distances, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, and this was one of the reasons where I thought, you know, I have two colleagues here who know Winnipeg far better than I do, but I think that livability also has a lot to do with a particular identification with a place. And that's something that I found so interesting in the history of Berlin that had this rise, fall, rise, fall, rise again, because there was a commitment to that city as a place based upon, let's say, a certain, let's say, set of values of what constitutes this urban environment that was modified, but that basically remained in place over really uh, traumatic upheavals over time. 
And I think in terms of what Winnipeg, you know, that would be one of my questions with regard to, you know, how does, does Winnipeg, let's say, what constitutes that image of identification of memory for Winnipeg, for Winnipeggers? And it's not going to necessarily be, well, we'll have light rail or something like that, all of which I'm completely for. But what is really the resonant feature? What are the resonant features of Winnipeg that one really needs to identify and preserve and develop as one moves forward? So that would be, let's say, my response in terms of trying to bridge these mm. differing discourses here. Okay. Richard, anything? Um, and Michelle said we often end up in the same place, but we always have these arguments first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, I mean, I just have to say in, in all of this, I was, one of the other things I thought about talking about just in terms of car dependency, and, and plenty of places are car dependent. Uh, and, you know, plenty of my friends in Toronto are car dependent. I have, you know, the same experience. But uh, in terms of priorities of the city, I mean, I would love to believe that, that we're turning a corner. But until we have a real commitment to transit, which we don't have, I, I just don't see that as possible. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting to me that we've been talking about rapid transit. I left Winnipeg in 1983 to go to grad school. We've been talking about rapid, bus rapid transit on the route that we now have for at least 10 years at that point. And, and I mean, the, the rapid transit debate here goes back to the 1950s. So, and, and so far, we're almost, we've almost got the first leg of <laughs> almost. And, you know, I'll believe it when it's up and running. And, and now we're trying to plan around it. So, I mean, in terms of planning, we've, 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 we've come up with the route, and now we're going to see what the impacts are. And there are some good people working on this, and I'm, I'm happy that that's happening. But at the same time, around the same period in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, the city decided it had to have an inner ring road for cars. I mean, I, I can't understand why a city this small needs an inner ring road. I get the perimeter. I'm not sure about the inner ring road. And that land is still dedicated, and the city is blindly following the route to develop that inner ring road. And it seems like that's almost entirely to build more suburbs, ultimately. So I'm, I'm, I would love to believe that this is going to happen. Um, I, and, and you know, my story is more cautionary. This has come up every time. You know, every plan has said, we're going to grow. Things are going to be wonderful. We'll have a million people in 10 years. And it hasn't happened, and look what, what has happened. So, you know, it's not that I don't think that, well, I'm not convinced the growth is going to happen, but I think we have to be ready for it not to happen just as much as for it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> there's, an, there's an interesting uh, um, sign, I believe, that, that's a good one. Um, but I think that the, the sign I'm going to express is one that really will challenge Winnipeggers in terms of just how far they're really willing to sort of buy into this idea of uh, densification and uh, infill and area redevelopment. Uh, the city of Winnipeg is uh, poised to guarantee a $10 million loan uh, for a developer to uh, move forward to do Winnipeg's first transit-oriented development and uh, build, I believe, in the area of a, a, a thousand units um, that will literally be uh, at the terminus of the first phase of the Southwest Rapid Transit Corridor. Uh, you know, I guess it comes down to that, and it, and it becomes quite clear uh, fairly quickly that if there is a, a real wholehearted commitment to um, looking at developing differently, uh, it's going to require um, a lot of leadership uh, and a lot of uh, um, incentives and uh, a lot of uh, commitment uh, from a number of, uh, of, of, of stakeholders, uh, not just the developer, not just the city, uh, but it goes way beyond that. So I, I think that uh, in order for us to be successful, uh, there, there absolutely will have to be a conversation uh, about how far uh, Winnipeggers are willing to um, support uh, that type of development. Thank you all. And now, uh, folks, I would look for uh, indications of people who would like to make a comment or ask a question. If you would uh, raise your hand and one of, uh, one of my colleagues will come and find you. Okay, this one right here.
Uh, I've been in the city for over 40 years, and I think I've read every single plan that has ever been written. If you want to sit down and read them consecutively, you should have a large bowl of Prozac next to you. <laughs> because they've said the same things over and over again. And my question to, I guess, our panelists tonight is, when the hell are we going to do some of those things? That, that, the most depressing thing we have to tell planning students is that planners don't make decisions, politicians make decisions. And this is where I will turn it back to you. Because the way you get politicians to do what they're supposed to do is go out and tell them to do it. And it's not the plan. We're, as planners, we're going to make the recommendations. As citizens, you can make the politicians do the right thing. So it, it requires some political activism to change the way things are done. I, can I just do Sorry, one sure, one? yeah. I, I guess one of the, the, the quandaries that, that's presented uh, uh, because of the fact that, that development is, is, is largely done by developers. You know, and I mean, that's sort of maybe something that a lot of people aren't very comfortable with. But there is a great, great deal of, of um, risk that is assumed on behalf of developers um, to actually contemplate uh, doing things differently. So, you know, I mean, I look at the, 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 the problem ahead for Winnipeg, and it's one really about how are we collectively going to help facilitate an environment that makes it less risky, that provides a level of certainty and, and make sure that there is the public inputs, including rapid transit, uh, to make sure that these areas are successful. Maybe I can step into that. I mean, I, obviously, I mean, you need funds, you need developers for development, but uh, I think, you know, again, the models, maybe speaking to Richard's comment about political activism, one of the things that has been so interesting to watch in reunification Berlin is just simply the amount of political activism, much of which started already in the 1960s and 1970s with, with, the, uh, with the occupied housing, with the squats. These were all in areas that were s uh, actually slated for demolition. And people moved in and simply took over those sites. And sometimes the police moved in and moved them out. But basically through political activism, uh, they formed their social networks and their political networks, and then they became relatively insistent, right? They became insistent on who was going to uh, get office at a local level, and that basically made its way up the political structure. So post-reunification, there's already a network in place where a lot of these debates about what does the public, what does the public want? That there were, you know, there was, let's say, a cultural horizon that these debates would take place. They would take place in public venues and the politicians would listen, period. And so a lot of those debates were, were very, uh, oh, I mean, were very divisive. I mean, there were different models of development that were put forward over and over again. But there were some underlying strategies there. Public transportation wasn't a question, that was a given, right? Do we, don't we, that was, it was just simply a given. Densification wasn't a question, that was a given. The, the issues were then, you know, how much openness, how much, what is over-determined, right? What allows still for a certain amount of options, as Michelle has said, what do those options look like? What type of framework do they take place in? And there's a different level of, let's say, or let's say there is a level, I shouldn't say different, but there is just, there was a level of social cohesion and social responsibility there linked to political activism that made, I mean, if I hear 40 years here and I look back on 40 years there, I see what can happen in 40 years, right, very clearly. And part of it is just simply that kind of, what is our future about, where do we want it to go, and let's make that a public debate now. Thank you. I think there's a contribution up here, a question or comment? My name is uh, Janice Lukes, and I've been very involved in active transportation over the last um, nine years. And I'd be very interested in your comments or insight, and, and same with you, Dr. Barnard, if you'd like to comment. Um, we are positioning ourselves on the world stage here in Winnipeg with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and the Polar Bear and Research Center and such. 
but we're also positioning ourselves as a global multimodal transportation hub in Winnipeg, which is rather unique. It's been around, I guess, the concept for a while and morphed over time. And I I'm, I'm have a concern about the, um, you know, as a multimodal transportation hub, the transportation, the trucking component and the trucking aspect of it as we position, position ourselves for this, it will impact our transportation. I'm concerned about the, the livability aspects versus the economic <coughs> impact of something like Centreport. Um, the pedestrian and cycling transportation, the accessibility and the connectivity. And I'm, I'm really concerned, and this sort of segues back to your political comments, I'm very concerned that currently there's not really a, a provincial act of transportation policy that looks at at a development of a multimodal transportation hub. Um, so I'm concerned about it and I'm, I'm interested in your comments or input on how you think this center port concept will impact the city and our livability here. Who would like to start? I got one for you. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, it's, it's a very good question. I, I think the, the challenge um, with Centreport is that, it, from my perspective, uh, is that it, it approaches um, the, the creation of uh, spaces that are integrated and are, and are supposed to be um, really focusing on opportunities around live, work, play um, from exact opposite perspective. And they do so based on a fear of um, a business being challenged by uh, having folks uh, living and shopping and utilizing recreation and pathways within, within, their, within their area. Um, I think that, that cities that have been incredibly successful in, in pursuing business parks or, or that type of uh, uh, industrial area um, have, uh, have been very bold in allowing for uh, mixed use to actually occur within them. So I'm not quite sure where that discussion is at with Centreport, but I, I certainly um, see it as a huge missed opportunity uh, if there isn't a, an effort being put in place to, to, to make it a place that people actually can live by uh, and can use and, and also work at. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll just add a, I'm, I'm not convinced by center port in general. And first of all, I don't think it's particularly unique. It seems to me that every city right now is trying to develop something like that. And everyone comes up with the map that shows their city at the center of a network and everything radiating from it. <laughs> it you know, so I'm, I'm not convinced of its uniqueness. Um, I'm very concerned about its truck orientation. If it had more of a rail orientation, I might be more enthusiastic about it. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried that it's an industrial park with an expressway, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was a comment here, a question here. Oh, hi. I have one for uh, Ralph Stern about um, his definition of graffiti as the photograph that you showed doesn't seem to be graffiti, but more of a, a you know, a group expression and notice boards and artwork and so on, changing on a kind of communal basis. And then, then we have uh, uh, wall murals that are big commissions are rising from groups of people to control graffiti. So just curious where you might, uh, uh, how you're defining graffiti and your thoughts it's on a, that. That's a very interesting question, fabulous. I'm, I'm not a graffiti specialist, I guess I would have to say up front, <laughs> right? Um, but what I do find interesting is exactly the mix that you describe, right? That it is a mode of communication. So it, it you know, I, I've seen and I've got many, many, many photographs of this sort of one, the layering of posters, right? What happens in terms of the materiality of, you know, posters, you know, pasted one on top of each other for months and years. and and a cross section being cut through that. So there's a materiality, there's a mode of communication there. There's a history, there's a compendium of that communication. It's something that changes all the time. It's something that isn't over-determined, and I think that's what I like about it. 
I have lived in another city where the mayor went on record publicly saying that people who engage in graffiti, and he meant anybody posting anything anywhere that wasn't determined by some public office, should have their thumbs cut off. This seemed to be a pretty extreme position, but it was a mayor of a major <laughs> metropolitan center in the United States that said that. So I think, again, this mode of communication that cities and urban centers are places for communication and interaction of all sorts. What I liked in that one photograph with the two musicians, too, is that simply it's a no parking sign, right? It's kind of painted over, and so you have two musicians that have parked themselves there, which I think is just fabulous. So that's another mode of, let's say, temporary occupation and communication that I really value. I thought I saw a hand up in the, yes, in the back. Yes, this is. Oh, it's on. Uh, this is for uh, any or all of the panel. Uh, there are two elements that I'd like you to comment on in terms of their influence on making Winnipeg more livable if we're going to have another 180,000 people here or 50,000 or 20,000. Uh, and the first one is the um, elephant in the room, climate. How does that, how do you see that affecting uh, livability in the city and increase the possibility to increase our population? Uh, and to grow our businesses and that sort of thing. And secondly, political governance structure. Our council structure really doesn't allow for any particular um, member of council to advocate on behalf of the entire city. Because the setup we have, the power for each individual councillor just doesn't seem to lend itself to that. Um, and have. Have you looked at that issue at all and considered it in terms of how it affects the ability to be progressive? Thank you. Colleagues who would like to uh, start on that? Michelle, <laughs> looks like you want to. Sure. Uh, the, the first question, uh, you know, whether uh, I don't think poses an issue in, in any type of research that I've looked at. Uh, it simply isn't sort of a reason uh, why uh, someone would not move to Winnipeg. Uh, interesting research was just done on Winnipeg and it concluded that uh, Winnipeg has now turned a page in terms of uh, where, it, where it's at in, it, in its evolution of its economy and that our challenge is no longer uh, to, to attract business uh, I guess largely manufacturing base uh, any longer, but it's really to attract folks to actually uh, shore up our supply of uh, of labor, and you know that's a very sab savvy and mobile labor force. So it'll be very interesting, I would say, over the next 15 years to see who stays and who goes, and and why they stay, uh, and maybe 15 years from now there could be some research done on whether weather played played a a, a role in that. Uh, in terms of the, the political uh, uh, structure, without question, it, in, from my perspective, uh, creates a very significant double-edged sword. Uh, the community committee structure, I think, um, positions uh, councillors in a way that um, maybe uh, does not provide them with the, the capacity to, to make global decisions which might be in the best interest of the city. Um, and. Uh, it, and I think that continues to be a challenge for, for Winnipeg. Um, and I completely agree that the, the ward system just doesn't engender itself to, to, to really having a real uh, comprehensive discussion about the, the vision and the future of this city moving forward. I think uh, on the winter question, or the, the climate question, and I think it's interesting to note that for me the most urban moment in any year in Winnipeg is the first day they open the skating trail on the Assiniboine River. And there are just hundreds, if not thousands, of people out enjoying each other and enjoying the city at the same time. And I think that's just a, a fabulous moment. Um, in terms of the type of city that's good to have in the winter, a denser city means shorter walking distances. This makes a lot of sense to me. So I mean, I think that, that the winter actually supports the idea that we should have a denser city. And uh, the political question, I lived in Buffalo, New York for two years. Uh, it's a very, a city with some similarities to Winnipeg. Um, 
not all of them good. And, but when I first moved there, they had a combination, uh, a hybrid political system where you had ward-based counselors and uh, four or five counselors at large. And I thought that was a really interesting way to get at some of those issues because you had people who spoke to issues that weren't just what was relevant to their constituents. Um, they don't have that anymore and that has to do with other things in the city and corruption and things like that. Um, but that wasn't a result of, of, of that system. It's just, I think it's sad that they lost that. I, I can't say anything to the political structure here, but just in terms of the climate, um, just a simple observation. I think that the single family typology is one that is not particularly energy efficient in any which way, shape, or form, uh, both in terms of heating the structure itself, you have so many exposed surfaces, but also just the lack of density, as Richard said, everybody needs a particular road, they need their driveways, they need their garages. Um, there are much more compact models that I think uh, are much more energy efficient directly in terms of just your neighbor is heating your common party wall along with yourself. Uh, then you don't need private transportation any longer. You don't need any of that stuff. So for me, it's a, it's a typology question leading to a morphology issue. And Thank fewer you. sidewalks to plow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Thank you. Yeah. And up in the middle of, yeah. Oh, thank you. In these discussions, um, the issue of control over urban development is bound to come up, uh, and it did in terms of developers or politicians, and we could extend the list to, to consumers or other sections of society. But there's an element which um, is all, often there, but it's not um, recognized, and, it's not, and use is not made of it, uh, perhaps to the, to the extent that it could be. And that is that our relationships among each other uh, are a profound influence on urban development. And at the same time, urban development is, is a profound influence on our relationships among each other. Here's a little example. I know a guy who drove uh, every day along those streets, like uh, same as the ones that, that Michelle pointed out. He had been out of work for ages, finally got a job, and would go and get stuck in traffic and love it. And he would look at the people over there, and say, we're all going to work, and we're all stuck in traffic. We've got to, and you do the same thing on the other side. So there was a kind of a, like a bonding among people who, you know, <laughs> sort of hated aspects of the lifestyle. But, but you know, that, that really literally drove them. Uh, Winnipeg oh. has some really neat things about it, and, and the relationships that we have when, on the first day that the River Trail opens uh, and those things are, are really important. So the, the point I'm trying to make is this relationship between our relationships among each other and our urban forms. It's a two-way sort of thing. Uh, and I'm wondering if the panelists can uh, see ways that, that we as planners might be able to utilize both those two sides of that relationship in order to uh, achieve the kinds of urban development and social relations that we're, we're trying to achieve. I think, <clears throat> I'll ask the panelists, many of us would like to meet your friend. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's stuck I, in traffic. <laughs> I, I don't find myself feeling so uh, so friendly and connected to the people that are <laughs> stopping me from getting where I want to go. <laughs> but reactions? It's your turn to go first. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what you say is, I mean, <laughs> clearly correct, right? I mean, this sort of mutual connectivity. Um, I, you know, again, I think that this is uh, what I find in North American environments, put it this way in general, is that there are frequently not those opportunities given for that discussion to take place. And there are structural ways of, of, of having that occur. You know, one of the ways that I've seen it occur elsewhere is through uh, the requirement for a competition for any large development project that takes place, that it is a public competition, and that the competition is then used as a way of facilitating a discussion. Um, in North America, in, in America, in the United States, 
you know, even if there is a competition, it's usually an invited competition amongst the select few, predetermined. And there is a winner, and then there are the losers in true American fashion. Uh, let's say it, I know other examples where there's somebody who's first place or somebody who's second place, and that's really a discussion because it can always flip. And then there's third and fourth place and fifth place, and they all pre present, let's say, images of possible ways of existing, of mediating between those different interests, right? So that that discussion becomes a not an all or nothing, but a much more nuanced and a much more developed discussion and a much more inclusivist discussion. I, I, I think we all have stories that could respond to yours. And, you know, my, my first, I'm remembering, Arthur, being away from the city for 20 years, coming back, going to the theater down in the, you know, the, at the warehouse at, at MTC, and first big snowstorm that winter, and someone was stuck, of course, you know, trying to rock their car to get out of the parking lot. And the, the stream of people coming out from the theater, just, they were, no words were exchanged, just people diverted, pushed, and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it was, there was no exchange of any kind except this sort of mutual understanding. And I think, and I keep hearing this, that Winnipeggers are friendly. And I think that actually is true, even if I disagree with some of them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that Winnipeggers are friendly. And if I think that if we could, that taking planning processes out of sort of private spaces or you know, out to the street would be a way to get people to talk. I mean, let's, let's have some planning. I saw in Chicago a few years ago, I saw them discussing an area revitalization project around a subway station and they were set up in the, in, in the subway station with boards and people were talking and people were stopping and talking about it. I mean, let's, let's make the planning process more public and not something that's in a very sort of controlled environment. I think we have people here who will want to stop and participate and discuss things. So I think there are ways to do that. I would, I would assume in many ways that this evening is, is one of those modes, right? That this will hopefully be the first of many discussions about what constitutes livable cities and then this city as a livable city. If, if I can just quickly respond as well. I think, I think one of the challenges facing uh, planning is that we, we continue to be stuck in, in this, this notion of um, like use-based plans, right? We don't spend a lot of time or effort, maybe we are starting to do more of this, with really um, illustrating the possibilities uh, through the planning process uh, and, and really trying to um, invite uh, uh, a discussion about what the contemplation of an area might be from a conceptual basis all the way into an implementation um, um, actual plan. Uh, we tend to, uh, the planning processes that I've been involved with, uh, with the exception of, of maybe the Winnipeg process, has really been about um, like looking at use space zoning and, and it's that, that's just so boring, you know? And it, and it really is just about segregating uses and just really applying this kind of very rote application um, uh, to, to areas. So I, I think we can do better than that. I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, what, whether it's somewhere in between like sort of form-based uh, um, planning or somewhere in between, but there, there has to be a, something better than uh, use space zoning. Thank you. So I see two questions here up on this, on this middle aisle. We'll take the first one down below and then the gentleman up above next. Hi, so uh, my question is just for Michelle Richard. Uh, you had mentioned that we we're expecting a growth of 180,000 people in Winnipeg over the next 10 years. I was just wondering if you could tell me, or if you knew what proportion of that is due to rural migration of like rural Manitobans, and whether or not you think the uh, the growth of the city would be worth the possible stagnation of the downs. Sorry, I didn't catch your second part of the question. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me, in your opinion, whether the possible growth of the city would be worth the stagnation of the towns in Manitoba. Uh, the, the vast majority of the growth is forecast um, for Winnipeg and actually the, the surrounding metropolitan area. Uh, and this again is being sort of proofed out right now, is really 
um, as a result of the successful uh, provincial nominee program, which is a, a immigration, international immigration based program. Uh, so th the vast majority of that growth is, is coming from, uh, from other countries. Um, but your question, I think, is one that is, is real, and I believe it's happening, and I suspect that we are picking up um, some of that growth. I don't actually have those numbers in front of me, but um, we would be, Brandon would be, like those kinds of um, uh, areas, absolutely, because we are absolutely seeing that shift. Another question, comment? Yes, uh, I'd like to go back up to 30,000 feet or so. Um, I'm, my name is Richard Croft, and I'm here as an interested uh, Winnipeg citizen. I want to go back to that list of, of most livable cities that was put up at the beginning, because I found it quite bizarre. Uh, it just sort of went by with the suggestion that we should accept it. I, and I, I don't accept it at all, but some of the bizarre elements or that there's seven cities, as I remember from the list, between Canada and Australia. So that seven of the list come from countries that have a total population of 50 or 60 million people, which is not much uh, less than, than Shanghai. I mean, I, if that is some kind of a guide, or if that's <laughs> supposed to represent some kind of thinking, I don't understand it. Uh, to me, Calgary, as compared to Winnipeg, uh, I mean, we, I'd be prepared to argue that all night, or Toronto. Uh, Vancouver stands as a testament to what nature can do and what planners can undo, as far as I'm concerned, as well. <laughs> so uh, if, there's, if there's some sort of paradigm that we were presented with at the beginning and that we should, in our minds, be striving for, it has escaped me. And uh, I would appreciate any comment that our panel might have on on that opening position. Thank you. Well, I'll just clarify. I mean, we were very critical of that list in much the same way you were in the session in Salt Lake City. I mean, I was just saying, part of it I was saying is that, that that's actually a very elite group of cities that only attracts, or, or that only a very small group of people can actually afford to be in. So actually, I mean, if I showed you the bottom of that list, which isn't up there, but you know, down hundreds, you know, then you're getting into to cities that have some real issues of basic needs. And these are all cities, first of all, where people's basic needs are probably mostly being met. Many of them have semi-decent social welfare systems that are still helping the people who are living there. Um, but I, we certainly weren't, and I certainly wasn't, accepting that acritically as, as something that, that we should just accept as the most livable cities. And I'm saying that in many ways, they didn't address for large parts of the population livability. And from basic needs up, you know. Thanks for clarifying that. We'll take a question up here. I've noticed uh, two types of planning and development in Winnipeg. You have the organic uh, sections of the city, such as Wolseley, uh, Osborne Village, Cordon Avenue, and Crescentwood. Um, that type that's viable by being organic and the community itself developing in a certain way. And then you have uh, something like Waverly West that promises to be ge geothermal, and then they get there and uh, find out that the water is incompatible with geothermal, which I would have thought they would have discovered before they planned it. Um, the rapid transit bounces from bus to rail to now it's a parking garage for city workers. Um, <laughs> Riverside Drive was to be a whole community of restaurants and so on. I pity the poor cliff dwellers that live on Riverside River Drive. Why is it that when government gets involved, things go totally awry, and when communities do it, it's really quite viable? You're closer to government. <laughs> what a fabulous question. <laughs> 
absolutely so dead on. I mean, the, and I don't know if, if the, the planning practitioners in the room agree with this, but I, I mean, the challenge for, for planning, I think, uh, is uh, to come to terms with the fact that it should never try to replicate um, a, an area that has, has developed in such an organic way, like you said, and has, uh, has really created itself over time, decades, decades. You know, and, and the notion that we can somehow just take the, the core elements of those areas and transplant them, you know, into, into new development to me is just absurd. And, and I, I don't know what the answer is, though, um, because ultimately, uh, if we are to, to look at uh, uh, planning and planning of areas, um, there has to be something to, to guide that. But I have, um, I certainly believe that uh, um, the notion that you can, you can take a, an urban area that works and somehow transplant it is, is just not realistic. It, I just challenge a couple of, of the things that you said. Though. In Waverly West, yes, the government was involved, but that's largely a private sector initiative. And that's not a, I mean, that was planned by the private sector and approved by the, by the government. That was not a government planned neighborhood. They plan and then check in that case, and we can. We, well, but but I mean the other thing that's interesting in what you said to me is that the places that you defined as organic are on are on grids, and the places that you defined as sort of government, as the Waverly Wests are sort of can of worms <coughs> things, or more can of worms things. What's interesting to me in in is that there's it, it's difficult to create, as Michelle said that that mix overnight in a new development. But Osborne Village and Wolseley and all of those places have come out of a grid system, and the grid system is actually much more flexible to change. So, you know, the, the current Waverly West, Linden Woods, all the other neighborhoods I love to talk about in less than glowing terms, you know, are surrounded by arterial roads and there's no way for them to really change. The, the Osborne Village, I mean, uh, where's, the dip, where's the boundary between Osborne Village and Corridon Village? Nobody really, I mean, everyone has their own boundary. And those things and those uses and, and who occupies that and how neighborhoods are defined for individuals are fluid and change. So there's an element of the form and the small land ownership in there that makes a difference to the way things happen. And they are actually heavily planned in their own ways. I mean, there's still zoning there. But it's allowing for certain things to happen, whereas when you get out into the suburbs, into the Waverly West, I mean, everything is well, what I call snout houses. Person here in the second row. Apparently nobody else does. But. Um, one of the things that makes Winnipeg most livable for me is the green spaces. And I guess with the, all the new bike routes now, I've been out exploring and uh, traveling along some of the riverbanks. And uh, what I discovered is uh, there's a, there used to be a lot more rivers than there are now, but a lot of them were paved over, so there's very few left. So, um, and now with development uh, of those areas, especially maybe with the golf courses, um, how much of the Seine River and those different areas, like a lot of the golf courses are along uh, riverbanks, and um, that would be um, sort of adding an excellent uh, livability quality for city developers, especially um, if we're living in um, concentrated housing. So I'm not sure what the plans are for the city to um, preserve those areas and how much of that area they would preserve. Uh, and also um, the value of the wildlife in there as well. Is that any kind of consideration? Um, oh, so, uh, uh the city councillor is up there. Maybe he'd like to answer some. <laughs> uh, the, there, it, through every planning process, and I and I believe that that this is this is consistently uh, applied and, and is actually um, practice. Uh, there there is a requirement to 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 plan for green and open space. Uh, Winnipeg is, is fortunate enough to have uh, an ecologically significant la natural lands policy that it can sort of rely on to help guide uh, the, the planning of, of open and green space. But uh, without question, um, the expectation I think is growing more and more uh, that uh, that becomes a priority at the beginning of the planning process as opposed to an afterthought at the end, how are we going to deal with the green space? 
I just, I just want to add to that that we do tend, planners tend to think, and, and probably others tend to think about, there's built spaces and there's green spaces. And I live on the 18th floor of a building, and I can tell you that most of this city is green space. Mm -hmm. And that we have to think about the streets as being part of the green system. And we have some fabulously treed, fabulous treed streets. And I'm not sure that we're, you know, we're losing a lot of trees every year. This is actually another social inequity issue because we're mostly losing trees in poor neighborhoods because there aren't enough volunteers to help with, with the banding and all those other things. So I, mean, I, I think, I mean, if we want to talk about things that characterize Winnipeg, people will say snow and mosquitoes. But I think trees. I would, I would, let me just say something also, because I really appreciate the comment just about bike trails and about, again, open spaces. And one of the things that I find, I mean, Winnipeg is certainly supportive of that and moving in that direction, and I think that's to be applauded completely. Uh, I think it could do more. And, you know, even, you know, when I drive out along Pembina Highway, uh, and I see these poor bicyclists, you know, that are completely exposed. And I think, my God, I mean, even if you're doing that, what kind of, you know, what kind of experience is somebody having? Always, I assume, being concerned that they're going to be clipped by somebody or another driving by. And so I think that, you know, this notion of how do you, you know, how do you develop? You know, I'm trying to think again about this terms of live, this term livability and livability for for me is really about vibrancy. And vibrancy comes about through density. And density for me comes about through accommodating lots of different uses within a very, let's say, compact spatial realm. So that means that you do have to have a road network and you have to have a bicycle network that is not just simply a little more space on the side of the road, but is an independent, interdependent system. And you have to have a river network and a stream network and, you know, that is yet again another layer. And it would be really interesting to see a comprehensive view of Winnipeg in those terms, that you really begin to develop, you know, these layers of different kinds of activities and different kinds of uses, and then see where those all intersect, where those meld. And those become then the definers, let's say the hot spots within the city that would then determine perhaps, you know, real areas of potential growth. I'll take one last question from the gentleman in red in the back, back row. It's on. It's on. Okay. Um, just a couple of questions, uh, or a couple of comments first. Um, the, I'd be, I first arrived in Winnipeg 40 years ago, and there was talk at that time of a rapid transit coming out this way. So it's maybe a long time in coming, maybe longer than many of us think about. Uh, the second one, second c comment that let me just throw in there is that there are some uh, geothermal developments in West Waverly. Uh, so what's going on here? You know, is it not suitable or, or what? What's the real question? Now, um, in talking about livability, uh, most of the examples that I've heard from the panel today have all been south of Portage and Maine, with the sole example, perhaps, of the Exchange District, perhaps. So what are we doing for North Winnipeg in terms of livability? And what brought that to mind is I've recently, I've recently been reading a book called Arrival City, which I would really commend to you of examples from around the world of uh, cities that have accommodated uh, immigrants from rural areas, from the rural, rural people moving in, and immigrants from abroad. So Winnipeg, actually, when you think about it, is an arrival city. In the 1900s, it certainly was a rival city, and it is today. Uh, Michelle mentioned we're going to have 185 people 185,000 people, sorry, uh, moving in, a good number of them being immigrants. So what are we doing about uh, accommodating and making our city livable for the immigrants that are coming in? There's this book, The Arrival City, gives some examples of, of cities that have been extremely successful in that by adopting and, and embracing immigrants and others that have been 
quite unsuccessful. A couple of examples from US cities that way. Examples from Istanbul, China, and, and elsewhere around the world. So I do commend it to you, but the question is, you know, what are we doing about the, the north, north Winnipeg to make it an arrival, a comfortable arrival city uh, for immigrants and others? Briefly, colleagues? Well, I would say not enough is what we're doing. Uh, but we're also, of course, 10% uh, of the population is Aboriginal. We haven't really talked about that either. Um, this is a really major issue. Uh, also a very fast growing population. Um, I think we've ended up talking about the South because that's where new development has been happening and we haven't, it's true, we haven't talked much about the North. And, um, you know, there are plenty of things going on in the North End. I mean, there are plenty of active organizations working on, on community development, um, I community development initiatives. I think one of the things that's quite frightening and to just sort of make a, sorry, this isn't gonna be quite as quick as I wanted. Um, the connection between what we've been talking about in the South and what should be happening in the North is that one of the stories we'll hear is that we have to develop Waverly West because the money that the governments make from that will be put back into the inner city in the North End to make those places better. And so just the, the one quick story on not enough is when Royal, I think it was Royal Wood, Royal Oak Lake Ridge, whatever, one of those. Um, you know, they got something like a million dollars profit out of it, and oh boy, we're going to put that back into the middle of the city. A million dollars? That doesn't go very far. And they made organizations bid for it, and they split it up amongst three organizations to, and I think they did something like renovate 30 houses. You know, and for, so each organization basically got a, about the value of one of the houses in Island Lakes. And this is going to save the center of the city. It's not. I mean, you know, we can get into the suburbs as a Ponzi scheme at some point, but maybe we'll better wait until, <laughs> better wait for another day for that. So on a day when you're not feeling quite so inhibited, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Any further observations? Uh, yeah, I, I think, it, uh, I, I'd be curious to know what the metrics are in terms of uh, actually measuring uh, the impacts of several uh, grant programs, several intervention programs, uh, um, that are uh, up and running um, for, for the north of Winnipeg. Uh, there, is a, there is a program out right now that I think is trying to, a uh, project that's out right now that's trying to actually grapple with this and it's called PEG. And it's, a, it's the first stab at uh, a, a community owned, and by community owned I believe it's like the United Way uh, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs is involved, uh, the province of Manitoba, we may even be involved, I'm not sure. But, but the intent there is really to come up with a, a collectively owned group of community indicators that can be used to actually measure, uh, you know, how are we actually doing here? And I think the first one that they're actually testing is on poverty. So it'd be interesting to see where they're at with that. Um, on, your, on your point about the uh, uh, immigration, an, an interesting uh, scenario is playing itself out in Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, again, this would be something that would be interesting to measure over time is that a lot of new suburban single family homes are being acquired by folks from other countries who really have come here to experience the ownership of land. And it's something that's really fundamentally important to them. Uh, so again, that's something that will be interesting to track over time. I would say maybe just in, in that regard, I, I, I can't, again, speak so much to to the northern part of the city, though, I mean, the, the questions that are raised here are really fundamentally important. I do know in, in the exchange, I mean, one of the places I go shopping, a giant tiger. And I have to say, I mean, it's just a very interesting experience over and over again. It's just a totally, it's a, it is a completely different demographic. And, and, I've, and I value that. I think it's very good. I mean, I find it, it, it certainly enriches, coming back to my term, vibrancy. It certainly enriches my experience of the city in a way that going to Polo Park or something doesn't, you know. So I'm much more inclined to use those smaller stores and to really participate in those neighborhoods. I think one of the unfortunate things that happens, and I, this is a value judgment, and it's a loaded value judgment, obviously, but is that, and I've seen it, I've seen it in America, I can't really speak to Canada, but that immigrants who do come 
want to experience that sense of ownership, right? That sense of having their own suburban home. And the question is, and this comes back to perhaps my interest also in urban representation and issues of representation, is to what extent are the sales pitches that are out there for you know, achieving, let's say, the, the symbols and status of a good life, right, which is embodied by a single family residence and two cars in the garage and everything you know, surrounding all of that. You know, in what part is that something that is anchored within a particular North American, um, let's say, construction industry driven, highway industry driven kind of marketing that's been going on since the post war, you know, since the end of the Second World War. And if those images are again other, right, because of course immigrants come into European countries too and they don't look to buy single family residences. They look to finding great apartments in dense inner city neighborhoods. So I think that there's a question of at what point does one put out other examples and really push those examples and not subsidize, um, you know, again, highway industries or construction industries through tax structures, et cetera, and, and, and essentially create an unsustainable and unlivable environment for the future. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to ask Janice Ristock, Associate Vice President of Research, to summarize some of the key themes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to start, first of all, by congratulating the people on the panel because I think you've really provided us with uh, rich and uh, uh, informative presentations that have given us all an awful lot to think about. And I also agree that this should just be the beginning of several discussions that we might be able to have about livable cities and about the future of Winnipeg. And for me, when, th when thinking about all three of the presentations, I was certainly struck by the uh, unsettling questions or the examples that were raised in each of the presentations that made us reflect on larger issues. Again, going back to what, what constitutes a livable city? What do we mean by livability? Who's included and who's excluded in these notions of livability that, that we put forward? And I think ultimately we were also left with a challenge of how can we take collective ownership for the future of our cities? And I think that was sort of implicit in, in, in the remarks that the panelists were making. When I think about Ralph's presentation, I was certainly struck by all of the images that he showed where he took us from New York to Berlin and then made some interesting uh, uh, parallels and juxtapositions with Winnipeg. And I think his point for me was that cities certainly can go through these cycles of growth and decline, which can include destruction and uh, trauma. He talked about erasure of memory and identity. And to me, that really speaks to both the vulnerabilities of cities as well as the potentials of cities. And I think it's those two positions, that kind of dualistic state, that we have to keep on thinking about as we're planning for the, the futures of city globally as well as for Winnipeg. When Richard spoke, I uh, was very intrigued by his comments on uh, livability measures that are being used to help determine that list of best cities. I always go and look to see who's on the list, who's been dropped off, and what changes have happened from year to year. And I thought what was interesting is he, he pointed out that this, these measures are, are based on present circumstances, that they don't look at issues of sustainability, that they don't consider the needs of future generations or, or some of the cycles that uh, Ralph talked about. And so I was then very intrigued with, by uh, his list or his idea of choices that we have to think about for cities and was pleased to see things like thinking about transportation, thinking about areas to walk in, thinking about concerns for the elderly, thinking about uh, poverty. Um, when he turned his attention to Winnipeg, uh, uh, he wasn't perhaps as optimistic as Michelle, but I, I was also very struck by that image of our inner core and the red uh, squares showing the number of parking spaces in the downtown area. And that, to me, is a very uh, visible uh, uh, problem or concern that we have in our city. 
And so while Michelle might have offered a, a different view, I think she was really focusing on the potential for growth and for future po possibilities. And I was glad to hear her optimism. And, and while she was optimistic, I think she made it clear that we do have a, a challenge that we have to be able to bring people along in thinking about new approaches to build cities, to build our city. And that means we have to have strong leadership. So I think she was also ending with a challenge. Is Winnipeg ready? Are we ready for that challenge? Is there going to be that leadership for our future? So where I'm left, I guess, is sort of thinking again of the image of the uh, Center for uh, uh, Human Rights, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights that's going to be built in our city, and it's going to be at the Forks in the center of the city. And I'm also wondering what that... Uh, museum, its presence, its focus on human rights and social justice, what that means in our discussions about livable cities, and is that something that we also have to bring into the mix. So I, I think I'll end there, and again, I thank you, and I do want to say that I hope you're all continuing with uh, this line of research and scholarly work, and I'm, for one, I'm glad that you're in Winnipeg. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Janice, and I would also like to uh, again thank the panelists and all of you for, uh, for coming. Our intention with this series of visionary conversations is to engage in conversation about things that matter to us uh, in our city, in our country, in the world, and uh, I'm proud to be part of this community of scholars and to be able to introduce some of my colleagues uh, each time we have one of these conversations to you. But we need you to come, and so we certainly appreciate your, your presence here tonight. The next session will be focused on our aging society, Are We Ready? Uh, and that will be November the 9th in this room, same time, 6.30, uh, for uh, a little refreshment outside, and then inside for uh, the panel. I've been reflecting recently on this brief poem by Richard Wilbur entitled A Short History. He says this, corn planted us. Tamed cattle made us tame. Thence hut and citadel and kingdom came. It's a nice little play on words, isn't it? We think that we planted corn, but when our ancestors decided to plant, they became planted themselves. And when they decided to tame animals, we were tamed, in a sense, from what our previous experience had been. And those decisions have ramifications that the people who made them certainly did not at the time understand. And the challenge in these visionary conversations is to try to engage with the decisions we're making now and to try and anticipate what some of the entailments of them will be. Come back and join us again next time. Thanks for coming.